Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you um, to our event today. Um, my name is Miley Arvin, and I am co-director of Pacific Island Studies at the University of Utah. Uh, I'm really excited about this first event in our Spring Symposium series. And I am speaking to you from my home in Salt Lake City and want to begin by sharing the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement uh, that is written has been recently written for the University of Utah. So we acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government. And we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. So that's our, the official statement. Um, but I also hope that our words here today, though focused on Pacific Islanders, remain in good relation with the Ute, Shoshone, Paiute, and Goshute peoples. This series, Pedagogies uh, for Indigeneity and Diaspora, Pacific Studies at Home and Abroad, brings together a number of teachers, activists, and community leaders to talk about what it means to teach Pacific Studies in the current moment. In the pandemic fueled shift to online teaching and conferencing, what are the pedagogies, both old and new, that Pacific Islander scholars, activists, teachers, and performers are drawing on to educate and foster knowledge relevant to Pacific Islander people? The COVID-19 pandemic has presented so many challenges to our communities in the US, the Pacific Islands, and across the world. We want to begin by recognizing that so many of us have lost loved ones to COVID-19, especially because the pandemic has disproportionately impacted Pacific Islanders along, alongside other indigenous communities and communities of color. I want to briefly recognize one of the losses we felt most heavily here, that of Margarita Santini. Margarita was a fierce champion of Pacific Islanders here in Utah, and we honor the spirit and legacies of her extensive community advocacy. Um, and I believe at the uh, one of the April panels on education, um, they might be speaking a little bit more about Margarita then. So this event today is the launch of our symposium, which will continue on April 8th and 9th. Today's panel seeks to set the stage by sharing some important approaches to theorizing indigeneity and diaspora among Pacific Islanders. On April 8th and 9th, we will host four more panels to deepen our conversations about Pacific Islander diasporas and pedagogies in relation to four key sub-themes. The first, uh, gender and sexuality, uh, the, then the environment, and then education, and then health. Um, in each of these areas, we take special inspiration from the work of the late scholar and poet, Teresia Tewa. Her work, which so creatively transgressed disciplinary boundaries, continues to offer a vibrant model of teaching Pacific studies at home and abroad. The title of the panel today and those of the panels in April are all quotes from her work. So the structure for the panel today will be that our moderator will introduce the panelists, uh, and then each of them will have about 10 minutes to present and discuss their work. Then there'll be some time for panelists to dialogue before opening it up to the questions from the audience. So feel, please feel free to add questions to the Q&A box during the event, um, and we'll select as many as we can um, within the allotted time for panelists to answer um, after all their presentations are done. So uh, also please note that we have live captioning available during this event um, and to enable it on most Zoom platforms, you can look for the CC closed captioning uh, button on the menu of the meeting controls at the bottom of your Zoom screen um, and just simply click on that to view captions. Um, some viewers may also need to select show, sub show subtitle after clicking the CC button. So with that, I will introduce you to the moderator for today's panel, my colleague and co-director of Pacific Island Studies, Dr. Hokulani Aikau. 
Dr. Aikau is a Kanaka Olivi Associate Professor in the Division of Gender Studies and the Division of Ethnic Studies at the University of Utah. Dr. Aikau is the author of A Chosen People, A Promised Land, Mormonism and Race in Hawaii, which was published with the University of Minnesota Press in 2012. Um, then uh, Feminist Ways, Feminist Generational Cultures, Life Stories from G Three Generations in the Academy from 1968 to 1998 which was co-edited with Car Carla Erickson and Jennifer Pierce, also with the University of Minnesota Press and published in 2007. And with Bernadette Gonzalez, she has edit co-edited Detours, A Decolonial Guide to Hawaii, which was published with Duke University Press in 2019. Her ne next ethnographic project, Hoa Aina, Returning People and Practices to Heiia, uh, funded in part by UHC grant, it is a collaboration with Kako'o Oivi, a Native Hawaiian nonprofit working to restore wetland taro farming on the windward coast of Oahu. So mahalo, Dr. Aikau, I'll turn it over to you. Aloha, mahalo, Maile, for that introduction. Um, I too am coming to you from my home in Kokarni, which is the Eastern Shoshone name for the place we now call Salt Lake City. Um, and I'm also in my home with me today are my three children. So at any moment they could join us. So be prepared for that. Uh, the title of our panel today is um, in to search for roots is to discover routes, um, Pacific theories of diaspora. And as Miley explained, uh, we've invited each of our panelists to speak, speak to about for about 10 minutes about how they theoretically and pedagogically engage with key terms, indigeneity and diaspora. Each of our panelists have worked with these concepts in their scholarly activities, in their community engagement activities, and each of them are important voices in the field of Pacific Island studies. And so it's truly an honor to have them with us today. So I'll just begin with um, introducing each of them right now, and then we'll um, have each of them present, beginning with David and then going to Vince and then Kati. So bios. David Chang, A. Chang, is a Kanaka Maoli historian of indigenous people, colonialism, borders, and migration in Hawaii and North America, focusing especially on the histories of North American, Native American, and Native Hawaiian peoples. He is a distinguished McKnight University professor and chair of the, and chair of the American Indian Studies Department at the University of Minnesota. He has published a number of articles and essays and two books, The World and All the Things Upon It, Native Hawaiian Geographies of Exploration in 2016, and before that, The Color of the Land, Race, Nation, and the Politics of Land Ownership in 2010. David is, a, is also former secretary of the Native American and, Indi and Indigenous Studies Association. Welcome, David. Uh, next, we have Vicente M. Diaz, a Pompeian and Filipino born, is Pompeian and Filipino, born and raised in Guam, in Guahan, and educated in Hawaii and California. He joined the faculty in American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, in 2015, after spending some time in American Indian Studies at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, the Program of American Cultures at the University of Michigan, and History and Micronesian Studies at the University of Guam. At Minnesota, Diaz heads the Native Canoe Program, which uses indigenous watercraft for community-engaged teaching and research on indigenous water traditions, and the Digitizing Ancient Futures Project that melds indigenous Micronesian seafaring knowledge and advanced visualization technology virtual reality or augmented reality. He is also the former coordinator of the Micronesian Seafaring Society, a co-founder of the Guam Traditional Seafarer Society and the Ut or Canoe House, um, Sayan Tasi Fakamwan. I'm not sure my pronunciation is very good. His major work includes serving um, as the historian for the Chamorro Halita publication series, that rewrote Guam's history and civics textbooks and curriculum for the island's public schools. He also is the um, director of the documentary Sacred Vessels, Navigating Tradition and Identity in Micronesia, 
He, is, uh, he co-edited the volume Native Pacific Cultural Studies on the Edge with J.K. Helani Kawanui, another one of those key texts in Pacific Studies. And he wrote in 2010, Repositioning the Mis Missionary, Rewriting the Histories of Colonialism, Native Catholicism, and Indigeneity in Guam. Welcome, Vince. Finally, we have Katarina Taiwa, an Associate Professor and Deputy Director, Higher Degree Research Training in the School of Culture, History and Language, College of Asia and the Pacific at Australian National University. She was born and raised in Fiji and is Banaban in Ikiribas and, Af and African American descent. She was founder and convener of the Pacific Studies Teaching Program at ANU, founder of the Pacifica Australia Outreach Program, and co-founder and co-chair of the ANU Family Friendly Committee. She is currently chair of the Oceania Working Party of the Australian Dictionary of Biography, vice president of the Australian Association for Pacific Studies and board member and trustee of the Pacific Corporation Foundation in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Her book, Consuming Oce Ocean Island, Stories of People and Phosphate was published in 2015 and is taught across several disciplines, including Pacific Studies, Anthropology, History, and Geography. She also has a background in dance and the visual arts and is touring her multimedia exhibition, Project Banaba, to Auckland in 2021. Welcome, Kati. Like I said, it is a pleasure to have all of you here today. And right now, I'm going to hand it off to David for his presentation. Welcome. Mahalo. Mahalo and aloha mai kako. Nui ko mahalo ya hokulani, ya maile, ya tanji. Thank you so much, hoku. Thank you, maile, and thank you, tanji, for putting this together. And for all of you at Utah, this is an amazing event. And mahalo to everybody who's here to watch us. Um, it really means a lot to me to talk to you. Um, uh, to describe myself, I am a light-skinned uh, brown person with very short cut hair um, and wearing a dark gray sweater. Um, and I'm sitting in a home office with a dresser behind me. On top of that dresser is a conch shell, is a poo, which is a, a shell horn uh, that we use to call people together. And I keep it with me when I'm talking, when I'm teaching, because it reminds me of what I'm doing and the purposes there. Um, I greet to you um, from the land of the Dakota, um, in the historical land of the Wapakute Dakota, now close to the land of Mitawakatan Dakota people um, here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And, um, and I'm going to put up slides and those slides are gonna mostly be text. Um, I will emphasize certain words in order to make clear what's on those slides as I, as I go along. Let me try to share screen. <clears throat> Okay, the title of my kind of musing today would be Diaspora and Meakanu, a, di a botanic theorization. And um, okay, so I have to approach thinking about theorizing diaspora. And first of all, be very clear, I'm not a theorist and I'm not very good at theory. So what I do is I look for theory in language. I, I'm a historian, so I try to find out what is embedded in the structures and the stories and the language and the practices. And then I try to muse on that, but I'm not a theorist and I'm not trained as one. So I try to discover what's already there. And when, when and I have to proceed from a perspective and I'm not, uh, I can't proceed from a, from a broad oceanic perspective or Pacific perspective either. Um, I have to start from my own perspective. So I have to start as a Kanaka Modi, as a native Hawaiian person, and then um, maybe proceed from there and see where I can go and to and from there to build. And when we do that, when we think about diaspora from a Kanaka Maoli Hawaiian perspective, we start very often with the canoe, the Hawaiian, the va'a, the Hawaiian ocean going vessel that is often referred to as a canoe. Um, and it's referred to by many cognate terms in many Austronesian languages, the waka, the va'a, the wa, the wa, um, etc. The canoe is the vehicle that brought oceanic people all across the Pacific, far into the Indian Ocean. But of course, diaspora is not just about going someplace. It's also about staying there. And I'm most used to using Pacific languages, especially Hawaiian to think through questions, but here it kind of makes sense to start with the Greek. 
And in diaspora, which comes from the Greek, meaning the spreading of seeds. So in Greek, diaspora is at foundation a botanic metaphor, perhaps a planting metaphor. And Hawaiian and other oceanic literatures and ontologies, I would like to point out, are rich and fertile with botanic theorization if we look to them. Now in Olalo Hawaii, in the Hawaiian language, apua is a flower, but it's also to emerge, it's progeny. This is a slide showing the following words that I'm describing. Kupu is a sprout, but it also means to germinate, it means to grow. Ka'oha, is the taro corm that grows from the older root. This word is the root of the very famous and familiar word ohana, meaning the family or kin group. Kikumu means the trunk, the source. It means the origin, it means the teacher. Kamana means the branch, it means an extension, it means a variant. So what you can see here is something that goes well beyond the kind of familiar metaphor in English, the roots and branches kind of metaphor. And moreover, because it runs all through the language and the conceptually, and moreover, these are not metaphors. These are all the actual meanings of all of these words. We're not using them metaphorically. We'd be tempted almost to call them kauna, which is often a term that we use and um, that which comes from Hawaiian um, understandings of our, our literature and means multiple meanings or meanings that are often hidden or double meanings um, that are embedded in text in order to convey multiple layers of meaning. But these aren't actually kauna either. To me, I would think of these as the branching meanings of a word, the mana mana, which of course comes from that word kamana, a branch or an extension. It means to branch out in the sense of elaborate. And since I cannot theorize, I'm gonna try some mana mana ana. I'm gonna try some branching out in the sense of elaborating from this idea. And let us not forget that of course that word mana is a homophone for mana, sacred power, the spiritual power that matters so much in our societies and in our understandings. So let me try this kind of botanic theorization if I can. Um, now, the botanic unit theorization is actually really useful for us today. It makes me return to the canoe. The canoes that our ancestors navigated across the oceans contained more than just people. They also contained animals, pigs, dogs, rats. But today I wanna to talk about plants. It's to plants that I look, and it's through plants that I want to theorize oceanic diaspora. But it, I look at this plant, we have to look at it from an oceanic perspective, and that means thinking relationally, seeing the plant in relation to the whole world around it. And I ask, what's the relationship of the plant to the place that it grows? As oceanic people, we are mea kanu, okay? We are kanu, wait. Okay, these are kanu plants in their Hawaiian names. When I think about canoe plants, the plants that traveled on the canoes, we think about the taro, sweet potato, the breadfruit, the yam, the sugarcane, the arrowroot, the mulberry, the kava, and many other plants. So the slide that I'm showing lists these plants and their Hawaiian names to emphasize that these very important um, foods, um, structural things, things that we make cloth out of, things that we make this very important beverage, kava out of, these are plants that our ancestors brought with them on the canoes and they planted there far away. So on the next slide, I have a canoe, excuse me, the term onehano. Uh, onehano is another word or term that runs through Hawaiian conversations about diaspora. Onehano means literally the birth sands. And we use it to convey the idea of homeland. And to go broadly beyond Hawaiian, for Hawaiians who are in diaspora and for islanders, for oceanic people in diaspora, the homeland is very important. And it's more than just the home archipelago. It's more than just the home island. It's the place, it's the site, it could be the village, could be the compound, compound could be the valley. That onehano is very important in Hawaiian and for Pacific peoples more broadly. But it's not the only word for homeland. There is another word for homeland in Hawaiian. And that is kulaivi, which literally means the flat place of the bones, the plains of the bones. It's the place where the, in the old days, the ancestors, bone, the bundles of the bones of the ancestors were placed in order to keep them safe and secure. And today it might make us think about the place where people are laid and buried um, in the Western, in the more Western pattern of uh, sub-earth burial. Now in Hawaiian, I'm now showing a slide showing the word kanu. 
the word that we use for berry is kunlun. And this takes us back to plants and to the botanic theorization of diaspora. Why? Because that word kanu, that which means to bury, also means to plant. It means to place in the soil. All of those plants that I talked about, taro, banana, vauke, ava, all of the rest, all of those are what we call in Hawaiian mea kanu, which means the things that are planted, or if we want, the things that are buried. We kanu them just like we kanu are dead. And I am thinking about us in diaspora as mea kanu, as people who are plants. We have been planted in new soil. And one day we may be kanu ia, we may be buried in that soil as well. This is very personal to me because um, my father died in December of COVID. And his only hanau was Palolo on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. Um, but he was in Miyakanu and he was transplanted to Potawatomi homelands. And then he lived out his later years on Meskwaki and Sauk homelands. And that's where he passed away. So this makes me ask what does it mean to be a Miyakanu? A thing that is planted, a thing that is buried. And what does it mean for an oceanic theory of, trans of diaspora? Now, when we think about mea kanu, and now I have a slide, this is what does it mean to be a mea kanu, two things matter. We remember origins. And in Hawaii, there are plants where we remember the origins in stories in the very name of the plant. There is a variety of the ulu, of breadfruit, that is ulu upolu, which is named after upolu in Samoa. In Samoa, it's, it, we remember where it comes from. There is a variety of tea, which is called ki nuuhiva, we remember it comes from the Uhiva. So that place of origin is always important. But so too is the place where it grows. The Paternic reminds us that the, where it is kanu'ia, where it is planted matters. And in the Hawaiian sense, by being planted, this plant is fed by the land, the land which we call aina. And we must remember that the word aina, the Hawaiian word aina, meaning land, literally means that which feeds. The mea kanu has ties to the ancestral place, but it is fed by the land where it lives. We as ancestral, uh, we as diasporic oceanic people are mea kanu, and we are fed by aina, the soil, the air, the rain, the wind that is part of this land. Now, this is very complicated by the fact that we are in a specific situation of settler colonialism. And many of us as oceanic people find ourselves living in diaspora in, in settler colonies in the United States, in New Zealand, in Australia, okay, and in Canada. And so there are reasons to consider us settlers, and there are reasons why many would resist that term. But whether or not we embrace that term, we have to face the fact that we live within settler colonialism, and we may feel displaced, especially when we share, and, and, and this, this, this complications of this matter, matter very frequently when we share the same colonizer as the people whose homeland we are now living, or have we have been kanu'ia, or we have been planted. So given that reality, how to, what is our responsibility? What is our duty? What is our appropriate scope of action? To use the Hawaiian term, what is our kuleana? If we may be transplanted, but we don't want to be an invasive species, My father is not going to be buried on Sauk in Meskwaki land. He wanted to go back to Hawaii. And so he asked that he be cremated. So he has been cremated and once COVID allows it, his sons and daughters and nieces and nephews and our partners will bring his ashes home and we'll take them to Palolo. And we will bring them there and we will lay them there. And we hope that those ashes will go back to his Onehano and they will feed that Aina from which he sprouted, from which he is a kupu. But we also know that the wind will pick up some of that land and it will blow it. And we hope that some of that land will, will feed his kulaivi, the land where his, the ancestors lie, the bone plains. But I also know that my father was emphatic that he needed to feed the land upon which he lived. He, this was important to him. It's important to me. And I know it's important to everybody here. And that's where I want us to really think that we as mea kanu, as plants in diaspora who live on soil, 
How do we feed that soil? How do we live with that soil? How do we flourish? Because in Hawaiian, there is another word for mea kanu, for plant. And that is mea ho'oulu, a thing that flourishes, a fling that grows. And so the question is, how do we flourish and grow even as we work and continue to struggle? And how can that struggle be a means by which we flourish and grow? Thank you very much. Mahalo, David. That was fantastic. Such important questions and um, metaphors to help us think with. They're very, very productive. Okay, now we are going to switch it over to Dr. Diaz. Vince, you are up. Mahalo. So Vince, you will want to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Casalelia uh, Michael. Um, hello, everybody. I'm calling in from Minnesota and Makochi, homeland of Dakota people, in the immediate area where, where we're at. Um, David Al's a really beautiful um, presentation, and I, I want to offer. Um, what I hope is a framework that that is is uh, within which uh, what you presented resonates. Um, I'm um, I can be described as um, round, that brown, <laughs> and uh, a gray goatee. I want to begin with two quotes. The first from Apeli Haofa, to remove a people from their ancestral and natural surroundings or vice versa, or to destroy their lands with mining, deforestation, bombing, large scale industrial and urban developments and the like, is to sever them not only from their traditional sources and livelihood, but also much more importantly from their ancestry their history, their identity, and from their ultimate claim for legitimacy of their existence. This quote, this quote picks up for me the main um, term in my presentation, trans-indigenous, because in one clear package we have um, the sense of routed, rootedness without which we are um, not who we are. But also there is a very strong uh, sense of um, mobility in there that also demands being rooted to where we end up. And I wanna spend a little bit of time laying that out, but I want to turn quickly to another quote from Teresia Taiwo of Bite Onauti. Bite Onauti and fly, walking is for pathetic bipeds and swimming only half an option. Men see one horizon where you all see two. Perhaps that's why fishermen lost and unable to stomach any more of the sea feel fortunate to catch you so they may suck on your eyes. Fish out of water fly fish out of water, sea to horizons. This one emphasizes what we can call radical relationalities and subjectivities, radical subjectivities. Uh, and um, what I wanna present is trans-indigenous specific resurgence and radical relationalities and subjectivities as a framework for pedagogy whose content is best served in the vernacular and the vernacular practices um, of the people who have traveled and the people into whose home uh, they have traveled. So resurgence, roots and routes, radical relationalities and subjectivities. These three terms uh, are the key, um, the key terms that structure um, not only the teaching that I do, 
uh, but the research and I try to use this to organize uh, my practice. And indigenous resurgence, uh, here's a quick definition, historical and political and cultural movements of reasserting and rearticulating forms of self-determination, sovereignties, responsibilities, and accountabilities through embodied material practices, especially against new forms of neo and post-colonial reconsolidation through liberal re recognition, inclusion, and co-opting of indigenous culture, art, performance, often with indigenous complicity. The key word in re resurgence here, I think, is um, a kind of refusal of um, new forms of colonial power that operates by how we uh, participate in it. The, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on the idea of roots and routes. And the central takeaway here is basically that for indigenous um, indigeneity in the Pacific in particular, roots that connote um, deep vertical plantings to follow David in specific place through vernaculars and routes to connote technologies and techniques and histories of travel and discourses of travel long before European colon colonialism, but especially as mediated by colonialism. So routes uh, give us a sense of uh, mobility and uh, reach, so routes and routes, that these are not mutually exclusive. They are instead mutually generative, they're codependent. There's another, there's, there's um, a number of other uh, ways of thinking about roots and routes, thinking about indigeneity in terms of trans indigeneity. Uh, and I'd like to get to a point someday where trans indigeneity is redundant, that in fact, we think about indigeneity precisely as a tension, a productive tension between roots and routes. So some of the other uh, things that are associated with trans indigeneity for me is uh, in addition to adding mobility uh, and, and reach is um, a, an, an important um, way of um, theorizing pan-indigenous uh, solidarity, uh, but in ways that don't lose the specificity of uh, tribal and local roots. Um, and um, this is, uh, there's also, uh, this is also one of the things that I think uh, makes trans-indigeneity as an analytic uh, superior to theories of diaspora which while privileging properly uh, and uh, um, the dynamics of mobility and the ability to bring one's roots across time and space, across the oceans, uh, diaspora doesn't bid us to be accountable to the indigenous people uh, in whose lands we end up. Uh, and trans indigeneity, as far as I'm concerned, uh, um, demands that of us. But when we're talking about trans indigeneity, we're also talking about multi sensory and fully embodied practices. This is also a wonderful way to build comparative um, studies uh, through methods of juxtaposition uh, or a position. A position is a, is a nice new word that's going around for people that is a form of what's appropriate to the mode and the place that you're in. Um, between resurgence, refusal, uh, roots and routes. Um, these are the elements for me of what makes critical indigenous studies. The third point, radical relationalities and subjectivities is something that we're also very familiar with across the Pacific. This is defining indigeneity to, or in terms of our belonging to specific places our peoplehoods in terms of relations of kinship and reciprocity, mutual caregiving, for example, to other humans and to other than human beings, to other, other than human beings. And these relationalities extend to land, water, and skyscapes. So 
land, water, sky as ancestral, as, as ancestors, oftentimes older kin with whom we have the reciprocal relationships. But uh, land, water, and skyscapes also have their distinct relationalities with them so that oftentimes you can't see where land begins and water, uh, where land ends and water begins and so too with skyscapes. This introduces the idea of uh, inter or trans subjectivity that uh, we are not autonomous uh, individuals. Uh, we're, we're, we're interlinked, interrelated subjects with, with others. Uh, and it demands, therefore, the multiplicity in forms and materiality, the sensory perception, the, the multiple sense, bringing everything we have, all of our organs and sensibilities to what we do. Um, this entails expense, expansive and contractive territorialities, temporalities, like time and space. Um, and these operate at different scales. Um, I work out the details of a lot of this in a number of articles and essays. I, I'm not gonna go through this list uh, here, but um, um, I'm, I'll be happy to share this list and, and even share the articles with you. If you email me, you can reach me easily at, um, at uh, either vmdias at umn.edu or uh, go to our website, American Indian Studies at, um, at the um, University of Minnesota. So the form that this takes, um, this framework takes us is in a, a research pro a, 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 a program called the Native Canoe Program that uses uh, indigenous watercraft and water-based knowledge um, uh, of, um, from uh, across uh, native, native worlds uh, for teaching, research, and um, community building purposes. Um, the, the, how it works out is basically the, the content of courses, the readings, uh, the, the, the theoretical, material we, we rely on and even for methods for the research pro projects that we engage in. Um, um, try to work as much as possible at the level of vernacular and vernacular practices of the, of the, of the traditions uh, and peoples that we're talking about and we're, that we're following. So, uh, and the other thing I want to say about uh, craft is we're talking about, um, um, technicalities in, in, the, in the materiality of the watercraft itself, um, and, and, but also the craft of the traditional knowledge, uh, or most oftentimes oral traditions that uh, out of which these come from. For me, um, I've been working with um, canoe builders and navigators from the Central Carolines uh, for almost 30 years now, and, still try to maintain a relationship with them involving bringing them over. Uh, when we cover the Pacific, we're covering uh, uh, watercraft from all across the Pacific. Um, um, but here in Turtle I, um, Island, we're also using, we also cover uh, the story of the survival and the revival of canoe cultures um, and, and the different purposes they are used. Uh, uh, for language revitalization, for political protests, for for everything that canoes stand for, uh, for us back in the Pacific, uh, we find the same things out here. But also in lakes and riverine valleys, uh, we see the revival of, of all sorts of watercraft. Um, and so canoes have been a, a particularly powerful um, topic for um, really developing Different different courses for different um, um, for different topics. Um, I do one for indigenous environmentalism, but we could do this for courses on law and leadership, uh, language revitalization, of course, uh, and so forth. I wanted. Uh, I have a bunch of pictures uh, of uh, our launching. Uh, students from classes that we've organized with communities. 
uh, we take uh, part of a course that we do, for example, involves um, weekend um, paddles with, with Dakota and uh, Anishinaabe communities and at their reservations and lakes and rivers. Um, there's a one uh, research project that we're doing that involves uh, courses and, um, and undergraduate and graduate students back to indigenous futures. Um, partners with Micronesians in Minnesota in a town called Myland and Dakota folks uh, in shared efforts to build canoes, Micronesian canoes and Dakota canoes, um, but also pairing scholars in the social sciences, humanities and STEM fields um, to develop a um, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality um, um, counterparts to the actual uh, projects of building canoes. Um, it's not only building canoes too, but learning uh, uh, the craft of, say, Papu using, learning how traditional stars are used, or stars are used for directional purposes. I want to end with uh, just a, a little taste of some of the projects uh, that we're doing. Uh, Koki, can you tell me how much time I have? I, my, I lost track of time. Yep, you're over time. Oh, okay. Mm. So let me go ahead and, and, and uh, just simply say that uh, these slides and the links um, are readily available and I'll be happy to share it with anybody if you just reach me. Thank you very much. Mahalo Vince. We put uh, Vince's email address in the chat so folks will be able to um, get in touch with him directly. We can also put, we have also put in the chat um, a video that he was going to show at the very end. So all of those are already in the chat and available to uh, folks as you would like to follow through with them. So mahalo Vince. And next we will go to Kati. Welcome. Kamna Maori, Yandra, and Nisambula Vinaka. Just checking that you can see my PowerPoint, if that's all good. Yes, we can see you, we can see the PowerPoint and we can hear you, thank you. Okay, excellent. I was actually updating it as both David and Vince were speaking to try to make some connections between what I would, I'm going to talk about and what they were saying. Um, so, Vinaka Vakalevu Kampasin Rapa for this opportunity to gather with you in a trans Indigenous space and dialogue um, and to think about our Pacific Studies pedagogies and the relationship between indigeneity and the diaspora. Um, I'm coming to you from Nunawal and Nambri country here in Canberra, which is the capital of Australia. So uh, I think quite a different time zone and geographic region for many of you. Um, I want to acknowledge um, those traditional custodians of this land, this very unceded land, um, always was and always will be Aboriginal land that we live and work on. So um, I'm going to share a little bit of my work and uh, my research and how it relates to pedagogy and maybe focus a bit more on methods and the ways in which my methods, my research methods feed into that teaching, for example. And a couple of key words are multi-sited and multi-scalar, which um, any of you who have read my book might be familiar with. Um, I'm showing a slide uh, at the moment of my exhibition, Project Barnaba, um, where I have fabric that is screen printed with images from the archives surrounding me. Um, and I look like that, <laughs> a brown woman, long brown hair. Um, and at the moment I'm sitting in my office surrounded by 
images and posters from anti-nuclear movements of the past and also some packing boxes because I am in a temporary office here at the Australian National University. So just a little bit, I think it's really important when we're talking about Pacific studies to talk about the contexts, the political, social, cultural, geographic uh, contexts in which we work and where we're coming from. So for me, this slide, which is of uh, the deputy prime minister at the time, Michael McCormack, um, uh, sharing his opinion on uh, Australia's relationship to the Pacific and to the current paradigm of climate change that we live in, which is shaping everything that we do and think about here in the uh, South Pacific. The slide says, Pacific Islands will survive climate crisis because they pick our fruit, Australia's deputy PM says. So being located in Canberra, in the capital of Australia, near Parliament House, which is just up the road, means a lot of what we do is shaped by this federal level view of the Pacific and what the Pacific means to Australia from that perspective, which tends to be very pragmatic, strategic, and in my opinion, often exploitative and extractive while using words like aid and development and capacity building to um, uh, interpret that relationship as one that is beneficial to the Pacific. Whereas this headline really shows how Australia's relationship with the Pacific is often quite extractive, which is very relevant to my research about Banaba, which is um, a historical, um, example of that extractive relationship. Uh, before I go on about that, though, I want to acknowledge um, my elder sister, Teresia Tewa, the late Teresia Tewa, who, as you mentioned in the beginning, her words and her ideas have shaped a lot <laughs> um, of the things that we're thinking about in this um, symposium. Um, and definitely her work and her ideas about routes and routes and um, about Barnaba have very much shaped my own work and my own thinking. Um, it was her generosity of spirit that allowed me to go into the kind of work that I do about Barnaba because she could have done that work as well. Um, but also want to acknowledge the context, the similar context that she was teaching and thinking from, which is Victoria University of Wellington in the capital of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and the way in which the development of the Pacific uh, Studies program that she built there also helped her think, shape her thinking about this relationship between indigeneity and diaspora, and also the pedagogies that she ended up coming up with. The classroom is the metaphoric canoe for example, which is one of the themes um, of the symposium. So it mattered that she was in Wellington. It mattered that she was looking at the Pacific from that positionality. And I also want to acknowledge the ongoing work of that excellent Center for Pacific Studies at Victoria of University of Wellington that's led by April Henderson and Emilani Case, who are very much in that genealogy of, of Terry's thinking, while also doing very innovative and interesting pedagogical work and research and uh, PhD supervision. So I wanna acknowledge that, um, and this is just another beautiful image that I wanted to share uh, of my sister. Um, her um, image was incorporated into my uh, exhibition as well, almost like an ancestral figure kind of overseeing this ongoing work that we have to do thinking between islands and thinking between the past and the present and the future um, and so forth. So to zoom, uh, when I talk about uh, a multi-scalar and a multi-sided approach, I'm constantly moving between different scales, between thinking about things at a very, very micro level and at a macro level and doing these things simultaneously. 
um, the fact that Banaba is two and a half square miles near the equator in the middle of the vast Pacific encourages that multi-scalar thinking because when people say small, you haven't seen small until you go to Banaba and 360 degrees, there's no other island in sight. So the sheer uh, um, skill that it took for people to get there and survive there for thousands of years in a very harsh environment. So Banaba has quite limited flora and fauna and is in a great drought belt. There's constant uh, issues of drought that face Banaba and there's a huge one right now where everyone ran out of fresh drinking water and, and water had to be shipped in from other parts of Kiribati. The, the sheer uh, level of skill that it took to get there and live there and survive there is relevant to what I'm talking about today because I talk about how it takes millions of years to build an island and a much, much shorter period of time to destroy it. Um, and, and thinking about that sort of deep time versus a, the current time and the impact of, of you know, humans on the environment is something that I'm constantly um, thinking about, not just from an indigenous perspective, but from other um, trans uh, transdisciplinary perspectives as well. So that's Banaba and um, um, what happened to Banaba in terms of the extraction of phosphate, phosphate mining, which happened for 80 years, an 80 year period of mining between 1900 and 1980 resulted in Banabans um, going from that very small scale of living on the small island to, to creating a global movement where they were trying to have their voices heard at a global level, pushing back um, against um, imperial mining, demanding uh, independence uh, for their self-determination, sovereignty, and their voices and their priorities to be heard uh, at a global level. Um, and in the 70s, this was covered by all kinds of global media because people were just very interested in this idea that such small islanders could operate at such a global level, making demands on the empire, um, which had colonized many places around the world. But this particular kind of, of um, colonial extraction and its relationship to global agriculture um, was something that really fascinated people because it made them it had it made them think about their own consumption. Because when we're talking about global agriculture, we're talking about global supply chains and everyone's implicated in that process. So one of the metaphors that I work with a lot is this idea of consuming Ocean Island, which was the title of my book. Um, which is re related to some of the concepts that both David and Vince were talking about in terms of, uh, but particularly David, in terms of the land being the place that feeds. I just love how Banaba is just never a metaphor in, in that sense, as in people actually ate Banaba through the phosphate mining and the fact that phosphate feeds the global um, agriculture and, and um, the fertilizer chain. So Banaba has this very interesting story where our indigenous um, concepts of land and people kind of collapse with the industrial uh, colonial process of mining and extraction to feed the empire. That's where Banaban land goes. And that's what Bonobans were fighting for in the context of this slide, which is just a number of headlines from global newspapers uh, talking about what happened on Bonoba. Um, this is just another view of that, sort of putting it into a geographic perspective. So you have Bonoba uh, and the Central Pacific, the land displaced to Australia and New Zealand to farms in Australia and New Zealand, which then feed the global supply chain 
um, in agriculture and other kinds of agricultural products. And then you also have the displacement of Barnabans as a result of the destruction of that land to Fiji. So I'm always thinking between islands and thinking of how land flows from our island to other places and people flow from our island to other places. And then the stories, the archives, the evidence of this displacement also flows between islands as well. So in order to track it, you have to move between places. It's a very multi-sited sort of history, which then gives me a particular kind of pedagogical approach to Pacific studies where uh, Epeli Hawafa's concepts of our sea of islands are enacted in really specific ways by tracking phosphate and tracking barnabans and tracking labor and everything else involved in phosphate mining histories. So this is just another kind of visualization of that. Um, and then this is another way of putting it in terms of thinking about the transformation of the island over time from this spot in the central Pacific to this heavily industrialized space where the empire kind of writes itself onto the landscape and lays out all its industrial you know, mining needs on this landscape, which is already mapped according to indigenous epistemology, ontology, and social organization. So I'm always trying to keep these images in mind and then think about how that relates to the chemical process of transforming the island from the rock, which is teapa, right? So literally the word banaba means the rock. And we also have the concept of kainga, the land that feeds. And we also have tiri, which is the bones of Banaba, which relates to our genealogies, our ancestors, and all of those concepts work together. However, then an industrial chemical process comes into the equation, transforming the island into calcium phosphate or phosphoric acid. So I have to consider what is land when it goes from tiapa to phosphoric acid, which then feeds that fertilizer chain. So that multi-scalar thinking, you know, is really, really important because I got to deal with the molecules and think about what land is at that molecular level, because that's what the empire is interested in. That's what it needs. That's the way it calculates Barnabas' value to the globe. So working at all of those levels to think about what it is to be indigenous to this place that is in motion through an industrial and chemical, social, political, cultural, economic process. That's, <laughs> that's my approach. Those are my methods and multiple levels and scales of thinking. So to put it a bit more simply then, where is Banaba, where are Banabans? I think of Banabans as mind dispersed, multi-sited island and islanders. We are in motion and we are always between islands because in order to locate ourselves, we got to do some multi-sided things. So for me, this is a really different way of thinking about something like the diaspora, which sort of thinks about movement of people in a particular kind of way and home and away and those relationships. I, I'm not deliberately trying to complicate it. This is actually the story of Banaba, which automatically nuances those ideas of being rooted and being routed, I suppose. So just to end, because again, uh, Hoku just signal me um, if, I'm, if I'm going on too long. I transformed all of this into an exhibition because for me, this story is a Pacific story and it's a global story. Everybody's got to know this story. I know it's a small island. I know nobody's heard of it. I know people even don't know where Kiribati is, let alone Banaba, but this is a story of the Anthropocene. Like this is a story of the everything, of the empire and the impacts of, of, of 
the industrial process on, on the globe. So I worked with Yuki Kihara. Uh, this is an image of me and uh, Yuki in 2017. I am breastfeeding my child in the middle of a, of a meeting with the curators of Carriage Works who um, commissioned uh, me to do an entire exhibition about this story, working between the archives, archival images and this amazing space. And Yuki very much inspired that process as well and curated it. This was the result, Project Banaba. This is version one of trying to put this story into a, uh, you know, into a uh, 3D kind of form in a particular kind of space, which is the origin point actually of the company that mined Banaba. So when I create art about Banaba, it follows those routes. It is not like a random gallery somewhere like, oh, that gallery is interested. It's like, where's that gallery? It's in Sydney. That's where the company was based before they discovered phosphate on Banaba. So we did it in Sydney as kind of in a, to follow the story of Banaba in a genealogical way. So this is some of the images from Project Banaba and I'm happy to talk about it more later. I'm just gonna show you the images, but um, this one, I think, I don't know, brings together a lot of the issues I think we've been talking about in terms of the implications for indigenous peoples uh, of, of the empire and the transformation of that, those ideas about belonging um, through colonialism. So basically the slide says, if you sign the agreement, your offense will be forgiven, you will not be punished. If you don't sign the agreement, this is a lease agreement for the land. Do you think your lands will not go? Do not be blind. Your lands will be compulsorily acquired for the empire. It was a threat to Bonobans who refused to sign any further, sign away their land. So I hung it in the middle of the exhibition so that when people walk in, they're like, eh, that's not very nice. Um, so yeah, and, and on the flip side of these uh, fabrics that I'm ha I hang in there, um, I put the bones of the land. So this is what's left when the empire takes the land. What's left are these uh, uh, limestone pinnacles, which stick out of the ground, just like the bones of the land. Diddy, <laughs> right? It all um, comes together. So um, we applicate that on the back of what these are supposed to represent phosphate sacks, each sack of phosphate removed from Banaba. Um, that part of the exhibition is called Body of the Land, Body of the People. This part of the exhibition, which is a three screen projection is called Mine Lands for Teresia, based on her poem, Mine Lands, um, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, I can, read it later if people are interested. And then there's another part of the exhibition called Te Was Kainga, which thinks more speci specifically about where we all live together, the land that feeds us, and how Bonobans just like hang out and get on with life in spite of all of this drama of the past while still remembering it. Um, so this is the last slide. Um, this is a version of the exhibition that was done at MTG Hawke's Bay Tai Ahuriri, which is on the east coast of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, Alice Tupunga Somerville brought a lot of her students to this exhibition and we sat in the middle of the exhibition and this was with Pacific Studies students from Otago University and we kind of talked about what all of this meant and how it related to how they were doing their Pacific studies, but also what it meant in terms of the relationships between Māori and Banabans, okay? If we're thinking about trans-indigeneity, there's a very awkward relationship between Banabans and Māori because our land was taken and fertilized Aotearoa, New Zealand farmlands, some of which were owned by Māori as well. So the Māori curator who uh, welcomed everyone and um, you know, uh, spoke to, the, to this history was, he was really like really intense and really upset. And he said, eating other people's ancestors is the worst thing that you can do to them. 
because our land is filled with the bones of our ancestors because where else is it gonna go on two and a half square miles, right? If you mine the land, you're mining the ancestors. It's not just metaphoric body of the land, body of the people. So we had a really interesting discussion between Mali and Banabin and what that means in terms of environmental justice, social justice, political justice, and that trans-Indigenous relationship. So I think I might, be over time, so I might, uh, I hope it's clear how that relates to both teaching and research and methods and history and um, the issues we're, we're facing today. Kati, thank you so much. That was just, just purely genius. It was, and I, and the way that all three of your presentations really do follow each other so beautifully in, in a theoretical kind of way, but then also attending to the materiality of the work that you all are doing and the groundedness of it all is, is exactly why we wanted you all here today. And to get us started with this symposium because we knew that the three of you would bring different perspectives on a theme. And then in, in doing that, it would enrich all of our understandings. And so thank you so much. Um, before we open up for Q&A with all of our guests who are joining us and it's so hard to do this through zoom where we can't see everyone i wanted to give you all a moment to reflect on on each other's presentations um i could go on and do and, and talk about the threads that i saw and the connections and everything but i really wanted to give you all an opportunity to to do some of that reflection um, Kati, you are, as always, you know, threaded all of the what was happening before into your work. David, Vince, do you want to, you know, speak to some of what um, you saw as those important connections? There are so many. So, yeah, yeah Vince, I'd, you want to go? I, I, would, I, I would say um, I'd, I'd like to leave room for for comments and questions from the audience. I know I can talk on all of these all day with, with, with all of us. So this is exciting work and more material to work into our courses. Likewise, I would only like to say how rich this conversation is. And, and, and literally, as Kat, to think about Kati's presentation, about the question of, of fertilizing as opposed to extracting, of, of, of making something fertile and rich rather than taking is really what we're trying to talk about here. Um, when we're in other spaces. I do want to mark something without getting into the details. Um, actually, what I want to mark is the details. Um, for, for all of the work, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get into the details of, my, of what I presented, um, but, but I, th I think what I'd like uh, the audience to, to understand or at least appreciate is, um, is that for all of this, the, the material that we're working on, the, the three of us, uh, it gets down and dirty and, and, and technical and substantive and deep. These are not abstract things, as, as, as Terry said. They're, they're extremely personal and they're, they're confounding, uh, but, but, they're but they're very, um, um, they're, they're, they're very dense. Exactly. And I want, and that takes me back to something that David said early on in his presentation about, you know, working with this botanic metaphor. And then he also brought up the Hawaiian concept of kauna, the layered meanings of terms. But what I also am seeing amongst all of your presentations is that all of this work, theorizing, historicizing, contextualizing, has deep material realities, right? It is, and, you know, Vince always speaks to the vernacular, but it, and, and Kati reminding us that it's the molecular, right? Like when we are talking about specificity, it is at the molecular level. And we, you know, we talk about, and again, this goes back to Vince's slide where he's putting beside each other indigeneity and transindigeneity, right? And it's the roots with the routes, but then there's also the routedness of those roots, right? And that, that other piece of it, and, and what happens when, we shift terminology even slightly. Again, the multi-scalar, multi-sidedness, the temporalities of it are all just essential for doing this work in 
that radical relational subjective kind of way, right? And that is what makes it the critical indigenous studies as opposed to, you know, indigenous studies that um, or indigeneity that's being defined by, you know, nation states and or, you know, international organizations that are intended to maintain this, the colonial and empirical empire, the colonial apparatus and the empire, right? So uh, again, those nuances are fabulous. All right, some questions have come in and this first one is from Travis Hancock um, for Dr. Chang. I'm wondering if he has extended his linguistic musing on Mea Kanu to the recent, recent findings that the sweet potato in Oceania has genetic connections to South America and how that kind of plant voyage reflects mixing, trade, and even kinship between the two regions, native peoples, um, long before Euro-American colonialism took root. So how do you, yes. Mahalo, uh, Travis. Um, so I, I, I definitely see the connections. I hadn't been musing upon it in that way, but yes, I mean, it's not only, and we didn't need the genetics. We know that Kumara or Uala, we know from language and we know from story that this comes from the Americas and that very important food comes from the Americas. And um, so that transindigeneity tells us a couple of things. It's first of all, that these routes and routes are far older than colonialism. Colonialism determines many of the routes through which we live today, but they didn't create all of the routes and that these routes can be nourishing. And, um, and, that they, and that these connections can be very nourishing. And so it can provide us a model about how we can feed rather than extract. The sweet potato also grows by tendrils which spread across the ground and its beautiful leaves um, also are, 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 can be eaten themselves. And so it has this kind of, this, 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 the geography of the plant itself um, kind of speaks to the way that growth can spread in that way. We have different names for it. The Hawaiian name is the most unusual in the Pacific. It resembles the, uh, the original South American name, the least of all the names in the Pacific. So yes, I see that. And the last thing that I wanna say is, is that what I like is, I don't know if you did this on purpose, when we talk about the, what Europe and colonialism taking root in the Pacific, it not only took root, it took away roots. I mean, it literally took roots. And, um, and we, need to take that, we need to take that story and we need to think about it seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question that came in, I think is open for anyone who wants to answer it, but maybe Kati, since you spoke to climate change, I mean, well, that was in one of your slides is, how do you think climate change will affect the diaspora in the Pacific on a wider scale? How do we think maybe trans indigeneity, thinking about trans indigeneity in the context of climate mm -hmm. change? And sort of whenever uh, people the climate change migration is a big hot topic in Australia with lots of people who think they're helping <laughs> proposing the mass relocation of people from the Pacific to a place like Australia, for example, in exchange for some strategic and security, you know, a little bit like the Compact the Free Association, where it's like we'll make space for you here and then you just give us you know uh, uh the rights over your exclusive economic zones and all the, uh, the military and strategic and security uh uh dimensions of that space and so i've been pushing back against that automatic assumption that everybody wants to migrate and join the rest of the diaspora because of climate change because Obviously, the stakes back home are too uh, are too much just to go down that route. But I also remind people that people have been moving in Oceania and have been displaced already. So you have to think about uh, environmental displacement and the diaspora that emerges out of uh, environmental devastation in a you know in his historical way. <laughs> Right, and you have to make those connections between movements of the past, both that were on Pacific terms where people chose to move versus ones where they were forced to go. And there were a lot of forced relocations um, in the Pacific, many which are under, un, not understood very well. Like for example, the displacement of uh, Gilbertese or Ikiribas to the Solomon Islands. 
in the 1950s and the fact that there's this large Kiribati population in the Solomons and everyone's there again, what is that? So I feel like we need to take more uh, historically informed approaches to this question of how climate change will affect the diaspora. Obviously it's going to affect it and also people in the diaspora care a lot about climate change that, you know, the Pacific warriors are filled with young Pacific Islanders from Sydney and Auckland and Wellington who are very concerned about how it's affecting both the homelands and the settler colonial states that they're living in. So it's, it's complex. Thank you. Did anyone else want to comment on that or I can move on to our next question? Okay. So our next question comes from Leslie Fry, who is um, an assistant professor here in gender studies. And this question is for, for Vince, but again, others can also chime in. She writes, I wonder if he can talk more about trans indigeneity and flesh out a little more what this approach makes possible more generally and for him specifically in terms of the work you were doing, he mentions at the end of his presentation. So Vince. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Leslie, thank you for that. that. That's a really good question. I think this is the place where I can uh, shift to the vernacular. Uh, one of the best ways to understanding for, to understand for me the idea of trans indigeneity, in fact, how how it really take begins to flesh out, is can be understood in um, in a concept and a technique of travel called ETAK, E T A K, uh, from the Central Carolines. ETAK, along with the design of uh, the outrigger. Um, technology and the, the, the instrumentalization of stars directional for, for directional purposes. ATTAC, I think, um, is, is one of these uh, techniques and, and uh, analytics that allowed um, our ancestors to travel thousands of miles purposefully long before Europeans even started to go all over the place. Um, I, there's, there's, there's compelling enough evidence that um, that uh, the islanders reached the Americas um, five, 600 years before Columbus. Um, but ETAC, ETAC translates to um, moving islands. And it's, I've written elsewhere, it's a form of triangulation where you use three moving reference points to, to, uh, to be able to calculate where you are at any one time. And so, it's a way of, 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 uh, of keeping time and, and distance. It's a clock. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, a map. The three reference points are, are your island of destination, where you want to go, your island of uh, departure, where you just came from, and a third reference point. And, and uh, you steer in the direction of your destination island. Um, you backsight. Um, um, as your island of or origin or departure recedes from view, and you watch another ref, the third reference island move uh, from the star it's it appears to sit in when you leave or when you when you're on your home island to where it should be when you're at your destination island, and um, what 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 happens is that the the attack. Uh, it's also a way of um, uh, dividing uh, the point between two places into legs. Uh, and your first leg is, is the moment you shove off to the moment you can't see the island anymore. Uh, in that first leg, you are calculating, you're, asserting, you're, you're discerning everything you can about your environment, the seas, the land, the, the creatures, the, the, the clouds, uh, you're watching the stars, where you're heading, where your islands are moving, that kind of stuff. That first leg becomes your baseline, but that first leg is your home, your home region. It's the zone of the familiar. And, and once you, 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 uh, your home island disappears, you use all of that information and compare that against a new set of information that you're now presented with in this next vicinity you find yourself in. And you do this serially until you reach your home island. It's in this way that we can understand that, that 
the way to cross the largest expanse of ocean is actually always a series of negotiating um, the range, the, ro the realm of the familiar uh, and the next step. You're, you're constant, you're always, you're always only one leg away from the familiar. So you're, it's in this way that you're also moving your home island, which involves the ocean, which involves the local, all of the local ec ecological knowledge. Um, you're, you're, con you're basically moving it with you as the technique to, to understand how you're traveling, where you're traveling. It's how you move your island, in other words, that makes for the efficacy and the, and the ability to travel far and wide. This is not an abstract metaphor, it's a technique. It's a science of, of uh, using a completely different kind of cartography. So how that works out, I'll try to do this really quickly. There's a big community of Micronesians in, 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 in uh, um, Minnesota. They asked me, can I help them build uh, uh, a Micronesian canoe? They wanna, they wanna keep doing that in, my, in Minnesota. Um, yeah, I tell them, you really want to learn how to be a good Micronesian navigator? You're going to have to learn how to move from where you are to where you end up. You're going to have to learn to close the gap between the two. A good Micronesian navigator must always learn where she is and is adept at reading those signs in nature. And, 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 and that includes these relationalities between land, water, sky, human beings, other than human beings. To be a good Micronesian navigator, they're gonna to have to now know where they are. They're gonna to have to become adept at, at reading lakes, rivers, prairies, how the stars look there in comparison to where they came from. To, to be a good Micronesian navigator in the 21st century in Minnesota, you've got to build good relations with the Dakota people who know that's that zone. Plus we have all kinds of pro protocols about uh, what happens if you don't properly acknowledge and have good relations with people in whose lands you're, you're passing. We begin from that technique and we build programs and courses and curricula and relations. To be a good Micronesian navigator, we have to learn how to be a good relative to Dakota people. Thank you, Vince. We have a few more questions that just came in um, and we are also close on time. So I think that we can take one more question. Um, and I am going to go with this last one, which is a kind of a two part question. Where do you hope Pacific Studies will be in five or ten, five to ten years? And what are some steps you think that the next generation of Pacifica scholars, Pacific scholars, needs to take to build political and scholarly capacity that connects the Pacific diaspora with our homelands? Maybe each of you can maybe say a little bit about that, and these will be our kind of closing remarks. I'll defer to David and Kathy because I just talked a lot. <laughs> I defer to David first. <laughs> okay, that's not fair because I had to go first on the talk, so you know, guys. Uh, but thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to speak quickly. Um, uh, so, Gregory, that is such a generous question coming from you, of course. I don't know. Um, what I think I see that is happening that I'm very excited about is that there's three things happening simultaneously and I want them to grow together and strengthen one another, right? Um, and one is the deep rootedness in lands, in Banaba, in Guahan, in Hawaii, in Aotearoa, in Australia, and in particular lands there. So this very close sightedness is very important. I'm really excited to see that. The other thing is now we're talking about diaspora, right? And we're talking about 
the movement. We've already talked about movement, but all three of us together are suggesting that it, we, 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 we've, we've talked about homelands. We've talked about movement, but now we need to tie in a different element and this is important. And this is these other places where we go. And if we can start to think of this as one question, if we can start to think of this as one, without, without taking away the specificities of any of them, but as a way of doing a Pacific studies that is broad enough to be the Pacific studies, because if anything should be broad and exclusive and inclusive, it should be Pacific studies. I would hope that finding a way to bring these things together would be the kind of rich world that can not only enrich scholarship, but more importantly, enrich the world and be responsible to the world in which we as Islanders live. Um, for me, uh, in Australia, um, I hope Pacific Studies will be integrated throughout the curriculum in primary school, secondary school, and university level, because uh, the Pacific is the only place where Australia is mildly a superpower and like exerts its force and its uh, agenda. And it's the, they, this is where all the foreign affairs and aid and development and all sorts of funding goes. And yet Australians still know barely anything about the Pacific, including your basic geography. And so that's just too shocking and annoying for me. Um, so for me, it's a very, this really, you know, pragmatic, simple idea that we need better Pacific literacy in this country, informed by Pacific studies, teaching, pedagogy, thinking, uh, methods, research from all of you, and the way you do your Pacific studies in your Pacific, um, sites. And so the other thing that I've been thinking about then in terms of the next generation of scholars is how, how few, there are just too few Pacific Islander um, academics in Australia. I'm one of a handful that has an actual uh, permanent job in a university. So this context is really, really different from many of the, the other contexts which have Pacific studies. And yet again, the, uh, the sheer scale of policy that comes out about the Pacific from Australia that influences what the US is thinking, what China is thinking, all of that. Um, there's just like a real disconnect between those levels. So I need to focus a lot on the next generation of Pacific Islander Australian scholars. And we have some amazing ones. Um, um, that I'm working with at the ANU, Tale Manjoni, um, for example, Lisa Hilly, who's an artist. Um, I'm excited to see where their thinking will take us. Um, um, and I hope it reaches out to the next generation of scholars located in other places as well, who have all of you wonderful people to mentor and support um, them. Let me take a stab at this. Uh, on one part, of, I, I have mixed emotions. I'm, let me take a hard line around where I'd like to see Pacific studies, particularly in relation to uh, Islanders who are in the diaspora, who, who are not uh, where they consider home. Um, I'm gonna take a hard line and say that uh, if you're wanting to, to um, reclaim your roots, to learn your languages, to learn who your people were and are through the, through the power of the vernacular, but don't want to, to relate that, do the hard work of relating that to the indigenous people of where you are. Then, then don't do that. That's the hard line. Because if you do that, you're just like uh, imperialism. Much of what we're, we're stuck with with settler colonialism is people from elsewhere wanting to maintain uh, who they are on someone else's land with, with zero regard for that. And, and it doesn't matter to me if you're a Pacific Islander and you're really proud of where you are and you're and you want to speak your language and replicate your cultural practices in someone else's land, and you have no respect for 
the people off that land. Don't do that there. I'm taking a hard line. Now it could get messy because people also have multiple homes. But this is the political print. This is a this is an ethics. I don't think uh, academic practice, teaching, research, uh, uh, is uh, is beyond ethic ethics and and uh, what's right and wrong. And it's also a political statement. That's the commitment to indigeneity and roots. It's hypocritical to be about roots but not give a damn about the indigenous people's uh, own struggles around their roots. So it's a, it's a, it's a hard line, um, but I think that, uh, that uh, you know, some of the takeaways or, or the considerations here is, is first of all, place totally matters. Just as it matters for, for us as indigenous people, it, it, it matters where we are if we're not at home for someone else, unless we don't, uh, unless we have no problems with other people making themselves at home in our, our homelands, don't do that to others. You know, so, so, so there's that. That's a re specific response to uh, those in the diaspora who want to, to, to um, be connected. Connect, connect with your roots. That has to happen. I'm still trying to do the best as I can. Uh, 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 but uh, uh, and and in many ways the contingencies of uh, and exigencies and circumstances of why I am, uh, am in Minnesota Makoche uh, is going to have to be the place where I struggle through this. Uh, but you know I did that back home. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not indigenous to Guam either. <laughs> uh, my roots are to other islands, and and so I I'm still. I, I'm still doing that. So, so, but there's the, the question is also a lot broader than just how it plays for the diaspora. How, how would I like Pacific studies in, in the diaspora to play uh, 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 with folks back home? I would love people back home to be reading the kinds of uh, reading uh, what other indigenous people are doing and using that as a way to grow and build theirs their struggles. I'm a big fan of that. Thank you. I think that's really an appropriate place for us to stop because, um, you know, the thematics that we have organized our symposium around and the way that we are organizing and thinking about that, those two key terms, indigeneity and diaspora, are deeply political, right? And they do speak to an ethic that um, you know, us here at the University of Utah who are working collaboratively to build Pacific studies is committed to that indigeneity and Pacific Island studies isn't just about where we all come from, but it also is accountable to the places where we are in really deep, meaningful, material kinds of ways. And I, think, and I thank you all for bringing um, your perspectives and your expertise and your scholarship and your art and, and all of that to this conversation. I think it enriches us all. I think it also sets us up really, really well for um, our next set of the next part of our symposium. So thank you all very much. I'm going to switch screens for just a moment so I can show folks our um, program for our April events, um, which are on the screen. So April 8th, we have two panels, one focusing on the environment and the other focusing on gender and sexuality. And then on April 9th, we have a panel focusing on health and another on education. We invite everyone back to uh, join us in this conversation. We will just keep deepening um, and expanding the thinking and work that we are all doing. I also want to, um, let's see. I also want to encourage folks who um, we also have as part of our Pacific Studies program have the Pacifica webinar series and we hope folks will check that out uh, on March 26th next, oh, is that this week or next week? I don't know what day it is, I've lost track. Um, we have a panel with featuring Moloka'i community leaders. And then on April 23rd, 
we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Tina Delisle, also from the University of Minnesota. That is a powerhouse over there, people. Um, and in the chat will be some links that you can use to register for those events. And for any of you who are here located in Utah, or if you know any Pacific Islander graduating seniors or who are Pacific Islanders transferring from um, wherever you are right now and want to come to the University of Utah, we will be, um, we are hosting the Pacifica Scholars Institute again this summer. This is a five day intensive program aimed at preparing students interested in Pacific Island studies and higher education, culture and community based leadership and learning. That program will be hosted virtually in order to maintain safety June 7th through the 11th and applications are being accepted until through May 28th. And finally, for any Pacific Islander artists in Utah, please check out the Harvard Oceanic Collections Engagement Fellowship, which is really cool opportunity offering funding for artists to work with the Harvard Peabody Museum, Museum's Oceanic Collection. And this is um, a really exciting new initiative that we've just started. So again, some, lots of exciting things going on here and we invite everyone to participate. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mahalo, Vince Kupti and David for sharing with us today um, all of your brilliance and insights. So aloha, ahuiho, we'll see you all back in April. <laughs>